which is Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the Once again, happy to come before you on this third Sunday of Easter season. We are in the great 50 days of Easter. It uh, began, of course, on April 4th, and it will culminate on May 23rd, the day of Pentecost. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Let's stay in the present moment, Thomas, and welcome you once again on this April Sunday, April 18th to the Church of the Good Shepherd here in Vancouver, Washington. We are thrilled you're with us, especially if you're tuning in for the very first time. A very warm Good Shepherd welcome to you. Today I'm happy to have Bunny Dees back. She was our preacher last week, so you will recognize her if you don't recognize her by now. Uh, I tease her. We should, we should build like an a extra flat, an extra apartment off the church for Bunny to live in. <laughs> she is such a faithful, selfless, giving, devoted servant to this parish over the years, over the decades, literally, and to our Lord and Savior. And so once again, welcome back to you, Bunny, helping us out. And of course, my brother, Cleveland Rocks, Brian Schweitzer, making sure the camera works and captures all this, again, I can't say enough, this beautiful job that the Altar Guild here at the church does, even in our tiny little recording studio while we're waiting to get back into our sanctuary, how much blessed work they do to make this such an inviting and welcoming worship space. Okay, let's stand or sit, whatever your pleasure is, and let's sing together our opening hymn. and voices heavenward raise. Sing to God I 
Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. 
hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. 
hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to, you, to you, Lord Christ. Christ. <clears throat> While the disciples were telling how they had seen Jesus risen from the dead, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why? Do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord, speak to us this morning. Open our ears, but more than that, open our hearts to your word and what you would have me share. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let me dab my uh, big schnoz here. It's allergy season in the Northwest, and I'm paying for it. Excuse me. <clears throat> Love to hear those words. We're still, as I pointed out in the beginning, 
we're still in the great 50 days of Easter. So I've said this throughout my entire priesthood, almost 25 years. It's okay to keep going around from now until May 23rd telling people Happy Easter. They'll think you're crazy, but uh, <laughs> it's good. We need to hear good news. I hope I can give you some this morning. Uh, Luke, in his gospel, which I just read, uh, he gives us some good news. He is uh, contending with questions about whether Jesus was really raised from the dead or whether the initial disciples were just seeing visions of him, having visions of him, that he was a poltergeist, he was a ghost. Hence, Jesus' urgency to prove to the disciples that he is not a ghost. First, by inviting them to touch him, because we all know you can't touch a ghost, right? And then, I love this part, asking them if they have something to eat. If they have, if they have, if he can get, if they can give him something to eat, a fish. And we know that ghosts can't eat. Maybe they can, but I'm guessing they can't. So all this got me thinking about Luke's emphasis. Now, mind you, he's writing 55, 60 years after Jesus died. It's a long time. It got me thinking about Luke's emphasis on the physical element of Jesus' resurrection. There's something in Luke's account that is fundamentally physical, earthy, intimate about our existence and about the promise of resurrected existence as well. And so I think it's really, really important, and Luke points this out, the way he tells his story that emphasizes that Jesus is not a ghost and that the disciples didn't merely have, you know, too much wine and they were seeing visions or ecstatic visions. No. But what they actually saw, touched, and interacted with was with their Lord in a physical way. Friction, touch, physicality. Now this, I think, ties in with what the Apostle John, which Bunny read this morning, was trying to convey in his, his letter, his first letter, his first epistle. Quote, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Right there, right out of the gate. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I've always loved this imagery of father-child. Mother, child, grandmother, grandchild, grandfather, not yet, grandchild. Listen again to the words from 1 John. We, you and I, he says, are children of God. Let that sink in. Not surprising that Jesus himself oftentimes uses childlike imagery and being like a child when you come to him to describe the way he expects our response to be to him, our faith walk, if you will, to be with, with him, very tender and loving, like a mother with her child. That intimacy, that physicality, this is what I'm getting at. This is incredibly liberating in my humble opinion, and it does change everything. It is why Easter morning, the resurrection, changes everything. Jesus physically rose from the dead so we can see, touch, feel, hear, taste and see that the Lord is good. I think you're with me now, but I hope I'm not losing you. Got more to say. Paul Oh, yes. Paul, in his great lofty letter to the Roman church, builds upon this theme, if you will, where he says in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, quote, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, 
It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that he may also, so that we may also be glorified with him. That's a beautiful testimony right there. You see, across scriptures, and especially in the New Testament, the story is told, not one of humanity's journey of self-improvement, if you will, or spiritual enlightenment, but rather it's actually the eternal, holy, loving God and Father who embarks on a journey of humility. Paul says this from the jail cell in Rome to the church in Philippi, the great hymn of humility in Philippians, Christ humbled Christ's self and took on flesh, even human flesh, and died death, even human death, even death on a cross, remember, so that every name in heaven, on earth, and under the earth can bow and obey at the name of the Lord Jesus. Incarnation, the Word becoming flesh. It's all about what God has done for us, not what we can do for God. There's nothing that we can ever do, right? I'll get to in a second how we, unfortunately, the, the tempter, the deceiver, the, the enemy, Satan likes to flip that and get us to believe our own hype. If we just read the Bible more, if we just go to church more, if we just put more money in the plate, all that's going to get us closer to God loving us more. Let me tell you something. Newsflash. God don't care about any of that. God just wants to know you and for you to know him right here. It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. I've always said the hardest thing for us believers is the 18 inches for it to go from our brain or all of our, all of our religion, all of our theology, all of our belief system is up here to get it to drop 18 inches and to get it in here. That's that childlike faith. That's that faith of a child that, that has awe and wonder and says, Daddy! Man, I miss my kids calling me Daddy. <laughs> Now it's old man. <laughs> but that intimacy, daddy, to be gender inclusive, mommy, ooh, I'm preaching now. Okay, okay, maybe take a break, come back, get a cup of coffee. I'm joking, but it's okay. You can pause the video on YouTube right now. That's a beautiful thing. And go get something to eat. Come back. I got more for you. I hope, uh, I hope I'm not boring you. I just feel filled with the Holy Spirit right now. So I want to say again, like many of you, like many of you, I was intrigued over the past week to follow the events surrounding the death of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, who died at the tender age of 99. He was only two months, two months from his 100th birthday. God bless him. And one of the things that struck me about his life, I, lo I watched a lot of the BBC news tributes to him. What struck me about his life was not only his devotion to his wife, you know, the queen. That's for another story right there. To his country, right? The United Kingdom. To the Commonwealth. Our friends in Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, India. But his devotion and faith to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I watch a lot of television. And as some of you know, and I make no apologies for this, I am a Gen Xer. And I grew up with my family's Sony Trinitron right smack dab in the middle of our family room in the rectory. In fact, the story goes that when my mother and father took the call to become the rector of Church of the Nativity in Newport, Pennsylvania in 1975. My mom, looking for me, wasn't going to find me in the backyard or up the alleyway playing with the other neighborhood kids. The story goes she could always see me sitting amongst the unpacked moving boxes 
plop down in the middle in front of the Sony Trinitron listening to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood <laughs> or Sesame Street or Schoolhouse Rock Conjunction Junction What's your function? <laughs> and uh, she would say my mother why don't you go outside Tom and play with your little brother Matthew or go meet some new friends and I'd always say oh I'm okay mama I'm fine right here watching television so believe me when I say to you, I watch a lot of TV. And I, again, I'm shameless about it. I always have and I always will. I love it. Not all of it, but I love it. I want you to listen carefully now, because I know I've lost some of you NPR listening people out there who don't own a television. And that is a, not a judgment, that's a love. That's I'm giving you love there. I submit to you that the best episode out of four seasons of the award-winning Netflix series, The Crown, is the season three episode entitled Moon Dust. That's right, Moon Dust, which explores Prince Philip finding faith in a secular age. I commend it to you. And if you don't want to go there, I'm going to give you a little synopsis. The episode is set in 1969 around the Apollo 11 lunar landing. Men landing on the moon. And for my money, that episode, Moon Dust, is one of the most insightful explorations of faith. I'll say that again. One of the most insightful explorations of faith that I have ever seen on television in my 54 years. That's saying a lot, because I just told you I watch a lot of TV. And this particular episode, which I must share, I'm indebted to my brother in Christ, Brett McCracken, for his review of this particular episode called Moon Dust. It manages, it manages to show both why religious belief is easily sidelined in a secular age and why in spite of everything people struggle to finally abandon it it's no surprise to any of us that this secular shift accelerated in the 20th century we're in the 21st now when mass media reshaped the world into one constant spectacle i read and had this book assigned 1985 freshman year at hobart college Sociology class, Dr. Brophy, still remember it. This book is called Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business, written by the late, great New York University sociologist and professor Neil Postman. Groundbreaking book. He was on it back then, and now he must be turning over in his grave. Dr. Postman must be turning over his brave. He probably has no idea, right, what, what, what we got today. Talk about amusing ourselves to death. That was 1985. Talking about, you know, TV. Kids in front of the TV. Losing our minds. Now we got Twitter. Now we got Facebook. Now we got YouTube. It's ruining our minds, people. Bear with me. With so many diversionary options and the opening up of the world indeed the universe how here's a question how does something like the church compete <clears throat> now Philip the Duke of Edinburgh's critique of church is that it fails to do anything productive I'm talking about back in 1969 this is the episode I'm talking about which you can see season 3 episode moon dust the crown on Netflix Philip critiques the church, and he tells his wife, the queen, quote, From now on, on Sunday, while you lot are in there, I'm going to spend this hour doing something useful, unquote. So his wife, Elizabeth, the queen, she goes and hires a young, new dean of the chapel at Windsor where the Duke was buried from yesterday, St. George's Chapel. 
And that dean in 1969 at the time was a guy named the very Reverend Robin Woods. At first, Dean Woods failed to impress the Duke. And especially failed to impress him when he proposed to the Duke, Philip, that he wanted to create a center where discouraged middle career priests can recharge by talking and thinking. Philip says to the young dean, you don't raise your game by talking or thinking. You raise your game through action. If I had a good British accent, I could put it on there, but I don't have a very good Oxbridge accent. So Philip begrudgingly attends the meeting at this retreat center, which he calls a concentration camp for spiritual defects. <laughs> Whereby Philip proceeds to let loose on the poor assembly of defeated priests who lament that people are increasingly looking outside the church for spiritual fulfillment. Boy, does that sound familiar. 1969, that is. Boy, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But I digress. Philip tells them, the discouraged clergy sitting around in a circle with their little collar on, sipping their cup of tea, what you lot need to do is to get off your backsides, get out into the world, and bloody well do something. Action is what defines us. <clears throat> Action, not suffering. Unquote. That's Philip. So the priests, talking and thinking, it's cowardly, according to Philip, compared to the remarkable bravery of the Apollo 11 astronauts. Whom Philip idolizes as gods among men. And yet when Philip meets Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins in person, his hallowed esteem crumbles. Turns out they're rather vanilla and uninspiring. Pale-faced men with colds and little capacity for thoughtful conversation. Ironically, they, the astronauts, were more impressed with Philip and his royal life than he is with them. And this is a wake-up call for Philip, who had placed all his spiritual eggs in the basket of human achievement. Even the greatest humans are fragile, mortal creatures. Even astronauts get a cold. They all disappoint. They all die. They can't carry the burden of ultimate meaning or existential justification. They are dust, and to dust they shall return, or shall we say, to moon dust they shall return. So a humbled Philip returns for a second meeting with the discouraged clergy he previously dismissed. Having admitted to himself his own weakness, grieving the death of his mother and his loss of faith, he confesses to the priests, I now find myself full of respect and admiration, and not a small part of desperation, as I come to say, help. Help me. There it is. That's, for me, the greatest moment in television history, where the scales come off and the heart opens up. Help me. God, forgive me for being so arrogant. And maybe that's where you are right now. In your faith walk. 
Maybe it's been years since you've even uttered those words to God. Or maybe you've never uttered them in your life to God. Help me, Lord. But if you're there right now and you're feeling what I'm saying, that's the Holy Spirit saying to you, I hear you, I love you, you're my child, you're my beloved. It's the big final hurdle all of us people, all of us followers of Jesus have got to get over. In other words, we've got to get over ourselves. We've got to hitch our wagon to the one who really understands every hair on our head, our deepest desires, our pains and our sufferings. He participates with us. He's physical. He's flesh and blood. Stick your finger in here, Thomas. My Lord and my God. That's who we worship. And you see, Prince Philip saw finally that every driven striver must eventually fall to their knees and learn. Some of us the hard way. That's another sermon for another day. I'm a well, I'm saying before you as a, a miracle that I'm not dead. We cannot save ourselves, friends. Man's glory, woman's glory is not about us. Our glory is in our relationship with a God who loves us and accepts us just for who we are. Such a hell of an episode. Here's the final quote I'll give you that Philip says. Thank God for Netflix, right? Man, listen to this. Quote, the solution to our problems, he's still talking to the clergy, the solution to our problems, I think, is not in the ingenuity of the rocket or the science or the technology or even the bravery no, the solution is faith. The solution is faith. And here is another reason why Christian faith, resurrection faith, thanks be to God, endures not only in the secular age of the late 60s, but in this secular age. And if and it's going to probably we're not even we're not even there yet with with artificial intelligence. Oh, buddy, when we start having robots driving our cars, going to the store for us, buy, I don't know, can you hear what I'm saying? We're either going to get sucked into that and we're going to lose our souls or we're going to remember the only relationship that gives life is life-giving is our relationship with God. A resurrection faith embraces all of that. It embraces suffering, as I said, but it embraces it with Easter hope. It worships a God whose glory is the shame of the cross on Calvary, but a God who also can relate and is right now with you in your darkest pain, in your darkest night, in that AA meeting, in that jail cell, in that pediatric trauma bay in that OR, in that doctor's office, in that, they don't have trenches anymore, I don't think, in the army, but in that tank, on that Navy ship, which Philip also knew a lot about, when bullets are flying at you, when your comrades are falling by your side, God can relate God is in that. And God says, death, you do not have the last say. And God redeems and raises up again what is dead and broken and literally ashes and transforms us into a new creation. When our tireless strivings fail us, we hear Jesus say, come to me and I will give you rest. When we reach the end of our rope and we fall to our knees and we feel like weakness wins, the devil's got us by the throat, the virus, divorce, bankruptcy, substance abuse, 
estrangement from those we love, political infighting, black, white, not getting along, Republican, Jesus says this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It's a good one. You got to commit these things to memory. We all need all the help we can get to awaken to the wonder and the significance of the promise of that first Easter morning that because he lives, we live also. Not the other way around. We don't have to wait till we die to receive the gift of eternal life. It begins now, my friends, now. It is we, you and I, who have the risen Christ in us. We share in his victory. And we are called to bring life, life to others, in his name. We are called to encourage we are called to lead sight to the blind. We are called to unbind the bonds of addiction. We are called to heal. We are called to witness. We are called to be the hands and feet and the heart of Jesus to a broken and hurting world. So as you journey through these great 50 days, indeed this Eastertide season, I invite you to share that with others. When you come in contact with them, when you physically come up against them, not online, that's not the same before you shut that garage door and you pull your car in, step out into the driveway, step out into the cul-de-sac, wave to your bloody neighbors and say, hey, how you doing? Hallelujah, Christ is risen. They'll probably run into their house and shut their garage door. <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about. Be bold. Don't be afraid. Today, tomorrow even, you and I may have a chance to speak a word to someone that we could never know, but we could help. And they proceeded to sit down and had a wee chat. Well, the story goes about a year later, something like that. This person wrote me a note to the ch at the church and said, you don't know me from Adam. But I walked into your church, you know, about a year ago, and I was fixing to kill myself. And I talked to this nice lady with a British accent. <laughs> and I want you to know I'm alive and well. And she, in that time, in that moment, on that day, she restored my faith that I'm going to be okay. That God loves me no matter what. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That, that's, that's resurrection. And that woman, even though she had some training in, in that, anybody can do that. Anybody can say and see someone who's hurting and say, are you okay? Do you want to talk about it? That's what has to happen more and more. Throughout this Easter, not just this Easter, but dare I say, today is the beginning of the rest of your life. If you really listen to carefully what God's been laying on my heart this morning, indeed, today could be Easter Sunday morning for you, maybe. So as you wake up and as you go to sleep, and as you walk, and as you sit down for me meals, ask God to help you to be fully alive. And not just so you feel better about it, but so that that aliveness radiates out from you and it touches others. God longs, although otherwise his resurrection is in vain, God longs for all of us to be transformed into a being a new creation, to be fully alive, alive in Christ, and alive to one another, to not be afraid. It's the gift of faith. It's the gift that Prince Philip got. And he was... He got married in 47. Elizabeth took the crown in 52. So do the math. 69, what's 52 to 69? 17 more years on top of, let's say he was 20. 
So he's a 40-year-old guy. Took me 30 years before I got my act together. I won't ask you, Brian or Bunny. Doesn't matter. Right now is all that matters. Whether you have come to faith 60, 70, 80 years ago, or whether right now you're ready to open up your heart to God and say, Lord, help me. I'm yours. That, my friends, is the greatest gift of all. Amen. 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 Now, standing if able, please join me in saying the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into, into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will never end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now please join me in the prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the churches of the Anglican Communion, for Justin, our Archbishop, for Michael, our Presiding Bishop, for Gregory, our own Diocesan Bishop, for this virtual gathering, and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. I ask your prayers for all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them loving them as he loves us. Pray for all who seek a closer relationship with Christ. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. I ask your prayers for all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Pray for those who have died. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Watch over us, O Lord, as our days increase. Bless and guide us wherever we may be. Strengthen us when we stand. Comfort us when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise us up if we fall. And in our hearts, may thy peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Lift up your hearts. <coughs> we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and we wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with the saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Yeah, and also, also with, with you. you. us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself. Yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. And then the time came for him to be completed then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine again. He gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, 
do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your Spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Alleluia, alleluia. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us now say together, Beloved Jesus, I believe that you are present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, Come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Let me never be separated from you in this life or in the life to come. Amen. Let us now pray together our post-communion prayer. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. A couple quick announcements and an Easter blessing before we sing our final hymn. This is what's right now in my heart here uh, Sunday morning, April 18th. Uh, this may be the week when the verdict is handed down in the George Floyd trial in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was talking to my friend who's a, a rector up there in a suburb of Minneapolis. And he said, pray for us, Tommy. So I said, yes, of course. And now I'm asking you and I'm inviting everyone who's listening to my voice. Please let us pray. No matter the result of the verdict, it's a tragedy on both sides. No matter the result of the verdict, that people remain calm and civil and are not prone to violence or destruction or, God forbid, murder and death. So come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people 
and especially the people not only in Minneapolis, but across our great nation. If you live near a big city like we do here next to Portland, we have our own share of almost nightly, it seems, rioting and violence and destruction. And indeed, a few months ago, half a year ago, we had a death. Someone was shot and killed. Enough is enough. Stop the madness. God's people, we need to humble ourselves and turn to Him. The devil's having a field day. So we just rebuke violence in the name of Jesus, and we ask for peace and calm to fill the hearts of everyone. Thank you for listening to that. Thank you also for telling your friends and family and neighbors about our beloved Montessori school as it is getting ready to reopen in September. We are taking enrollment as I speak. Please share with your friends. Give the church a call. We'll put you through to our school, and you can talk to our director, Michelle Wagner, Get them signed up. Get the kids back in class. Do it, do it, do it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for spreading the good word about our Montessori school. Also, good job about getting your vaccine. Don't believe everything you hear on the news. Bottom line is, vaccines work. Get them. Get the immunity going. Let's get back to normal. Enough of that. My wife said, you talk about that all the time. Well, it's important. I don't know if people listen to me, but that's the hope is at least one person out there might hear, oh, this pastor thinks it's important, so maybe I'll do it. I'm just trying to spread that love and spread that forgiveness and spread that healing power. We need it right now. We're in the middle of this pandemic, and this surge is breathing down our necks again. So there you go. Enough of that. And last but not least, since I'm coveting your prayers, continue, I pray, for the reopening of our beloved church. I know I put it out there that May 23rd on the day of Pentecost, we're going to be back in person. But you know as well as I do, that can go sideways. So let's just keep praying. Lord, virus, go bye-bye. Construction fence goes down. City of Vancouver gives us a thumbs up on reoccupying, permit, permitting, occupancy. Re All that goes good. Everything's ready to go. Safety team, sheepdog, reopening, sanitizing team, you name it. Lay reader team, videographer team, preacher team, and God's people. It's going to be a great day. We've waited this long. We can wait some more. Just keep praying. We're going to get back together. I promise. Thank you again for tuning in. We hope to see you again next Sunday for more of God's Word. God's sacraments, God's prayers, God's music, and most of all, God's love. We love you. I love you. Stay strong. Stay safe. Stay in the Lord. And now let's sing together our final hymn.
and sisters, let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.